picture, if you will, a lonely stretch of road cutting through the Australian outback. It's the dead of night, and you are hours from nowhere, hurtling along at 70 miles per hour. Now, you might be a rancher traveling the border of your property. You might be a trucker delivering badly needed goods between tiny, isolated towns. You might be a tourist, all alone and out of your depth. That doesn't matter. All that matters is you and the road, and an orange-red band of highway framed by pitch-black darkness on the other side. There is not another soul in sight. You might as well be traveling through the outer space. Suddenly, something breaks the hypnotic trance that the road has lulled you into. A glimmer far behind you, reflected in your rearview mirror. It's the first light that you have seen for hours. At first, you welcome the sight. You aren't alone anymore. And the light slowly and steadily gains on you, growing ever larger in the mirror. Eventually, it reveals itself not as a pair of headlights, but a single point of illumination. It is in a car. Maybe it's somebody riding a motorcycle, but as the visitor draws nearer and nearer, you soon realize something. Whatever it is, it's way too high in the air to be a light from a motorcycle. Depending on your disposition, you're either curious or terrified. Whatever it is, it seems to have taken a keen interest in you, never deviating from its position behind your car. Seconds pass into minutes, minutes into hours as the light stays fixed in place. A traveling companion that you never asked for, pacing you mile after mile. Then, without warning, the light suddenly blinks out, and you are left alone once more, just you and the road stretching into endless darkness. You have just met the Min Min Light. The Men Men Light, or Men Men Lights, are one of the most enduring anomalies found in the Australian outback. The scenario just described is typical of most encounters which predominantly, but not always, play out on the isolated outback roadways. Most often in midwinter during clear, calm weather. The light can manifest in the distance, following motorists for miles before simply vanishing as mysteriously as it first appeared. It is always silent even when making abrupt maneuvers or traveling in what seems to be hundreds of miles an hour. The Men Men Light is often white in color, but may cycle through several other hues during the course of a sighting, changing from white to red or green and then back to white again. Some witnesses are lucky enough to document their encounters with the Men Men Light in photographs or on video. Although reports can be found from practically every corner of the continent, the Men Men Light most often manifests in Australia's Channel Country. This region, so named for the braided rivers that crisscross the desert, predominantly lies in Queensland, but bleeds over into parts of South Australia, Northern Territory, and New South Wales. Other hotspots include the Air Highway, a thousand-mile stretch of road connecting Western Australia and South Australia along the continent's southern edge. Most Aussies will tell you that the area around the tiny Queensland town of Bulia is ground zero for Men Men at Light activity. Bulia sits on the eastern side of the outback and supports a sparse population of around 300 residents. Despite its isolation and tiny populace, the town hosts the Men Men Light Encounter Museum, dedicated to the history of the lights. This attraction comprehensively documents not only sightings, but presents a well-balanced attempt to explain exactly what lies behind this fascinating mystery. Explanations range from mirages to poorly understood natural phenomena to legitimate spirit activity, and even visitors from another planet. People who are genuinely interested in the Men Men Light are drawn to Bulia not only by the museum, but also by the chance to experience the apparition firsthand. Few adventurers are ever so lucky. They have a saying, the Men Men Light finds you, you don't find it. Anomalous light phenomena were well known to indigenous Australians long before it took the name Men Men Light. Most tribes believed that these were spirits, perhaps the souls of the ancestral dead. Often, the lights were treated as something to be feared. Like other luminous orbs found throughout the world, jack-o'-lanterns, will-o'-wisps, ghost lights, fairy lights, etc., this was considered foolish to follow the lights, as anyone who did so ran the risk of never returning. Just like elsewhere, Aboriginal parents used this unexplained phenomena to their advantage. 
keeping unruly children in line with the threats that they might be taken away by the lights. At the same time, a handful of tribes believed that the lights were beneficial, watching over witnesses and safeguarding the countryside. All indigenous Australians agreed, however, that the light increased in frequency following the arrival of European settlers. Exactly why is this? Bearing rational explanations discussed later remains a mystery. Regardless of the reason, reports of mystery lights in the outback slowly began trickling into the historical record. The first written account of the modern era appeared 50 years after the British had established Australia as a penal colony. In 1838, T. Horton James published Six Months in Australia, where he described an incident that unfolded in his outback. His company had set up camp and had just settled in for the evening when they saw a light glimmering in the distance. Figuring it might be another campsite, the party set out to make contact with what they then suspected were bushrangers. However, no matter how close they approached, the light always seemed just a little further away. They eventually gave up. Horton's account is noteworthy for several reasons. Modern accounts with the Min Min light often play out the same way whenever it is pursued. Horton's account is also highly consistent with all the ghost lights around the world, which exhibit the same uncatchable behavior. It's one of the main reasons for the prohibition against following them. You will never reach the source and will only be pulled further and further into the wilderness, where the risk of injury or getting lost increases exponentially. We even see similar mischievous behavior in modern day like cases where the light phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch in Utah is. One modern witness, a Balangara ranger named Birch, told reporters that he believed this was the Men Men Light's primary purpose, to distract people and take them off their chosen path. He based this conclusion not only off childhood stories, but his own first-hand experience with the Men Men Light. One day, while heading home after hunting, he and several passengers were driving back to town when a miraculous light appeared before them. Now, according to Birch, he says that they all stared at the light and all of a sudden, they were going in the opposite direction, going back into the bush and following the light without even realizing. They all wisely broke off the chase, and within a century of Australia's European colonization, drovers in the outback began to see the Men Men light bobbing along behind them whenever they looked over their shoulders. Those brave few who turned their horses around to pursue the light would find that its source always remained out of reach. Even setting aside paranormal threats, it's dangerous to walk into unfamiliar terrain at night. Today, the best way to investigate mystery lights is to approach the site where they appeared in the light of day. Men Men Light witnesses who follow up on their sightings constantly report that the area in which the lights appeared is either free of footprints and tire tracks at best, or is inaccessible at worst. More often than not, there is simply no rational explanation. The Min Min Light didn't earn its name until sometime in the early 1900s, when a traveling stockman suffered a harrowing encounter near the ruins of the old Men Min Hotel. Even the hotel itself is shrouded in mystery. Some say that the Men Min Hotel was a small family establishment set up along the Kennedy Developmental Road as a stopover point for stagecoaches traveling between Winton and Bulia. Others say that the drinks served there were overpriced, not because the difficulty of transporting goods to the outback, but rather the result of unscrupulous business practices carried out by owners living on the fringe of lawlessness. Rumors persist that the Men Men Hotel was a rough and tumble place where fights regularly broke out, and some of these altercations even ended in death. And supposedly, many rowdy rovers were forever interred in the dusty soil near the hotel's ruins. Regardless, the Men Men Hotel was burned to the ground around the turn of the 20th century. And it was sometime around 1917 when a lone stockman found himself near the ruins in the dead of night. As he passed a lone grave near the side of the hotel, a glowing ball of light emerged from the plot and began following him. In a fit of sheer terror, the stockman rode his steed as hard as he could to the nearest station, where he then filed a police report. The authorities responded like you'd expect. They laughed at him until more and more reports of an anomalous light began trickling in. These lights, once a staple of life in the outback, now had a name, the Men Men Light. The Men Men Light still appears in the vicinity of the hotel grave to this day. 
Filmmakers on site often report equipment malfunctions, their cameras refusing to operate, and their batteries suddenly draining of power despite being just fully charged. As mentioned, the Menmen light most commonly manifests along transportation corridors like roads. Many truck drivers who once boasted no-nonsense attitudes about the paranormal have had their lives turned upside down after seeing the ghostly lights in their rearview mirrors. Others stop along the sparsely traveled outback roads for a quick catnap, only to awaken and find a visitor glowing in the distance, silently watching them. In most stories, the Menmen light remains far away, never catching up to the witness and always withdrawing upon approach. In a rare handful of cases, however, people find themselves closer than they could have ever imagined. Claire Britton is the daughter of the Queensland rancher who, like so many other children in the outback, learned to drive at a very young age for practical reasons. She was about 10 years old when she was handed the keys and was allowed to drive to a destination known as Five Mile, which sat just over three miles from home. Because the prospect of driving by herself was so thrilling, she took every chance she could to practice her skills working the manual transmission. Along the way, she helped out by checking on her family's property. Late one afternoon, Claire set out towards Five Mile, where her grandfather was still rounding up cattle into the paddock. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until darkness fell on her home. Just as Claire crossed the main road, she spotted a bright glimmer in the distance. It seemed to be a single light. Claire assumed it was her grandfather returning home on the family's off-road motorcycle, which they used to patrol their property. Although the ag bike had a headlamp, it wouldn't serve her grandfather well in the failing light. Claire decided to stay put on the road, hoping her own headlights would mark the way for her grandfather's return. However, the light in the distance simply remained stationary, refusing to budge from the spot. Claire sat and sat, but nothing happened. Maybe it wasn't her grandfather after all. Maybe it was another car sitting in the road, and eventually, she gave up and decided to return home. She pulled onto the primary road and started to pick up speed. And as she did so, the lights rapidly accelerated, quickly closing the distance between them. She pushed the car as fast as she dared, fully aware that she lacked the experience to navigate safely. And as she did so, the light continued to gain on her. Closer and closer it came until it was right behind her. Then, without warning, it appeared in the car with her before just as quickly snapping out of existence. Claire managed to fight her shock as she drove the final half mile home. She parked, rushed inside, and her grandfather was sitting on the couch and had been for some time. Other common manifestation points for men men lights include old mines and railroads. Their appearance beneath the ground calls to mind all manner of subterranean creatures, including fairy-like beings like the German kobolds, which are known for manifesting lights in mines as well. Unlike kobold lights, however, the Menmen light rarely appears in bluish hues. As for railways, the Menmen light has been seen from countless trains over the years. Even before their electrification, railroads enjoyed a healthy reputation as the Menmen light thoroughfares. Their appearance is well documented, both in testimony from railway workers on the ground and passengers aboard trains. Sometimes, conductors would see the lights rushing headlong towards them, convinced a collision with another locomotive was imminent. In these tales, everyone readies themselves to jump from the moving train only to have the light wink out at the very last minute, saving everyone on board. Even more intriguingly, tales persist where guards aboard trains disappear shortly after the Men Men Light manifest. A thorough search of the entire train is mounted, but the guard remains missing. Only after the light disappeared are guards rediscovered in previously searched car with, with no way to account for their disappearance. These stories naturally bring to mind reports of missing time from contemporary alien abductees and those taken to fairyland in old legends. Three witnesses may have just narrowly avoided the same fate after investigating the railway in Cloncurry in 1997. Cloncurry sits four hours north of Bulia, which by outback standards is practically next door. The primary witness, who was serving as a railway work supervisor, was on duty with two others when he decided to make his evening rounds at 9 in the evening. It was already dark, but the procedure was quite routine. 
as it simply involved checking points along the railway to look for any issues that needed their attention. The supervisor and one coworker hopped in their pickup truck to begin their route. The entire affair should have only taken 10 minutes, but shortly into their inspection, they were distracted by something otherworldly. It seemed to be a single light, hovering about 100 feet in the night sky. Whatever it was, it was traveling towards town from the west. The workers' first thought was that it must be a helicopter, as the light resembled a work light. However, when they turned off the truck's engine to listen, the entire scene was completely silent. They then realized how odd it was that no other lights could be seen on this helicopter. It was just one solitary light darting through the air. The pair started up the truck once more and set off in the direction of the light, now completely baffled as to what they were witnessing. As they did so, the light hesitantly approached them, almost inviting them further, off course. The apparition bobbed along toward the river, where they parked their car to watch it float above the water. At this point, both men were certain this was no helicopter. In addition to being silent, it was far too low. What it seemed to be, in fact, was simply an orb of light flying all on its own. And to the men's alarm, within two minutes, the light flared brighter, drifting towards where they were parked. The passenger panicked, cramming himself into the footwell and under the dashboard, and desperate to escape whatever they were facing. His supervisor, however, was more curious than frightened and stepped out of the truck for a better look. As he watched, the object continued to draw nearer, eventually stopping within 30 feet to hover just above the height of his head. As he watched, the supervisor noticed that the object almost had its own quirky personality. It seemed intelligently controlled, acting fearfully whenever a loud noise or another light was shown in its direction. Whenever the orb came in contact with the beam of his truck's headlights or his flashlight, it turned black meaning it didn't extinguish, but it actually took on a black color. Whenever the supervisor extinguished his own light, the object would return to its original state. The supervisor grabs his radio and calls for the third railway worker to join them down by the river. At first, the third man was incredulous, suspecting he was the butt of a joke. His opinion changed, however, when he arrived on the scene. He too could clearly see the light and began excitingly discussing what it could be with other men, the most fearful of whom had finally emerged from underneath the dashboard. After watching the light continue its lazy course above the river, the supervisor decided to try and catch a closer look. He walked over to where the railway crossed the river and climbed the low bridge, keeping quiet the entire time so as to not scare the light away. And once safely atop the bridge, the light came closer, hovering over the rails. With slow, deliberate steps, the supervisor walked towards the light, but found that it always kept its distance between them, almost like a frightened child or animal. Occasionally, the orb would draw closer, close enough, in fact, that the supervisor thought he could reach out and touch it. But each time it backed off again, beyond his grasp. After playing this game for a few minutes, the light descended further, changed from white to an amber color, and shot off into the west at breakneck speed. Within seconds, it was out of sight, leaving the railway workers within a story they would remember until their dying days. What is the true nature of the Menmen light? Is it a spirit, as indigenous Australians suggest, or is a more prosaic explanation to blame? Over the years, people have put forth a number of possibilities, including theories about ignited gas seeping up from underground, illumination caused naturally by tectonic stress, or, most humorously, an emu with a flashlight stuffed up its butt. One of the more compelling explanations suggests that the Men Men Light is an example of the Feta Morgana. This type of mirage manifests when rays of light enter air strata or different temperatures, causing the light to bend. Feta Morgana are often seen wherever there is a well-defined horizon, like along the coast or in vast expanses of desert. Oftentimes, distant ships or mountains appear to float above the horizon. Feta Morgana can cause these otherwise mundane objects to distort, invert, or even multiply when photographed and seen by the human eye. It seems likely that Feta Morgana might explain at least some of the Men Men Light sightings. After all, these mirages are frequently seen playing with the appearance of hills and mountains around the Men Men Light hotspot, Abulia. 
Those who believe that the Min Min light is simply Feta Morgana suspect that distant headlights, floodlights, and campfires are to blame for these ghostly apparitions. This is consistent with the aboriginal claim that Min Min lights became more common after the arrival of European colonists. More people means more sources of light, which would naturally increase the frequency of these mirages. And at the same time, Feta Morgana cannot explain the experiences of witnesses like Claire Britton, who saw a light orbit her car, or the experience reported by railway workers in Cloncurry in 1997. Feta Morgana does not cause an intelligently controlled ball of light to appear feet in front of your face. If not Feta Morgana, then what else could it be? Some think that the Min Min light is a swarm of bioluminescent insects. Again, perhaps sometimes, but what swarm could travel in tandem at 70 miles per hour? Others suggest natural phenomena like ball lightning are to blame for the Min Min lights. While ball lightning can often create glowing orbs, the phenomenon is exceptionally rare and very poorly understood. Moreover, ball lightning is usually associated with thunderstorms, while the Min Min lights typically appear during clear weather. Reaching these dead ends, some folks embrace the idea that the Min Min lights are spirits, while others turn their imaginations to outer space. Is the Min Min light extraterrestrial in origin, perhaps an alien drone sent to investigate our species? Or does the Min Min light represent another intelligent life form inhabiting our world, as other researchers suggest, a sentient ball of plasma coexisting alongside human beings? We'll likely never know. The Min Min light is far from the only unexplained mystery haunting the Australian wilderness. Despite its low population density, only seven people per square mile. The nation sees an enormous influx of UFO sightings, alien abductions, and of course, cryptid encounters. Everything from tall, hairy Bigfoot-like creatures known as Yowies to surviving populations of dinosaurs are rumored to thrive in the forest and deserts of the island continent. One of the most distinctive cryptids that Australia has to offer is the Bunyip. Like the Min Min Light, stories of the Bunyip stretch back into Aboriginal prehistory, but persist through the modern era. The term Bunyip is incredibly vague. Both Aborigines and English settlers have employed the term over the centuries in a variety of capacities, applying it to any otherworldly creature in much the same way that the other cultures might speak of devils or spirits or boogies. And by 1852, the name was synonymous with humbug or imposter. In fact, some Australians in recent years have referred to conservatives whom they perceive as snobbish as the Bunyip aristocracy. Despite this ambiguity, one variety of the beast is given the name Bunyip more often than any other. Over the last 200 years, Australian Lake monster witnesses have regularly used the term Bunyip to describe creatures seen in the country's lakes and small ponds, famously known as billabongs. Most Bunyip sightings typically describe an aquatic beast of two types. The first is an almost sea-like creature or a long-necked monster. The seal variety often sports brown or black fur and a head compared to an otter or a bulldog. Long-necked bunyips, on the other hand, have more heads that more closely resemble a horse's or an emu's, with the addition of small tusks. They are also reported with horse-like ears, manes, and tails. According to cryptozoologist Tony Healy, 60% of bunyip sightings feature seal-like creatures, 20% horse-headed monsters, while the remaining 20% are too vague to categorize. However, on the rare occasion that they make landfall, all bunyips reportedly leave behind three-toed tracks. All are also capable of generating loud, terrifying vocalizations similar to the roar of an angry bull. The dog or horse-like description of the bunyip provides an interesting comparison point with the other lake monsters. For whatever reason, Creatures described as water dogs and water horses appear in a variety of traditions from all over the world. Most famously, Irish legend speaks of the Doverku, or water hound, while Aztec mythology warned of the Aswijotl, an aquatic canine that lured people to the water's edge before drowning them. Horse-headed lake monsters, on the other hand, can be found in bodies of water throughout the British Isles, as well as Scandinavia, Siberian Russia, Italy, France, the Czech Republic, and other Slavic countries. 
While neither dogs nor horses avoid water, they aren't animals anyone would instinctively associate with a lake monster. If they are simply imaginary, certainly lake monsters would resemble octopi, turtles, or even fish. So why do so many cultures describe lake monsters as resembling dogs and horses? Perhaps because there is some truth behind the myths. As in other countries, seeing these lake monsters was often described and considered an ill omen. Australian Aborigines mostly believe that bunyips are guardians of the water in spirit form, fond of devouring women and children. They are also capable of causing and spreading disease. In the early 19th century, convict William Buckley escaped his imprisonment by dwelling among the Aborigines for years. In his 1852 memoir, Buckley claimed to have seen a bunyip himself and learned from his indigenous comrades of the danger they posed. For a time, Buckley and his tribe lived along the banks of a lake named Mudawari. In this lake, as well as most of the others inland and in the deep water rivers, is a very extraordinary amphibious animal, which the natives call bunyip, of which I can never see any part, except the back which appeared to be covered with feathers of a dusky gray color. It seemed to be about the size of a full-grown calf, and sometimes larger. The creatures only appear when the weather is very calm and the water is smooth. I can never learn from any of the other natives that they had seen either the head or tail, so that I could not form a correct idea of their size or what they were like. Here, the bunyip, the extraordinary animal I have already mentioned, were often seen by the natives who had a great dread of them, believing them to have some supernatural power over human beings. So, as to occasion death, sickness, disease, and such like misfortunes. They have also a superstitious notion that the great abundance of eels in some of the lagoons where these animals resort are ordered for the bunyip's provision, and they therefore seldom remain long in such neighborhoods after having seen the creature. They told me a story of a woman having been killed by one of them, stating that it happened in this way. A particular family one day was surprised at the great quantity of eels they had caught for as fast as the husband could carry them back to their hut. The woman pulled them out of the lagoon, and this, they said, was a cunning maneuver of a bunyip to lull her into security so that in her husband's absence he might seize her for food. However, this was, after the husband had stayed away some time, he returned, but his wife was gone, and she was never seen after so great is the dread the natives have of these creatures that on discovering one, they throw themselves flat on their faces, muttering some gibberish or flee away from the borders of the lake or river, as if pursued by a wild beast. When alone, I several times attempted to spear a bunyip, but had the natives seen me do so, it would have caused great displeasure. And again, if I had succeeded in killing or even wounding one, my own life probably would have been paid the forfeit. They, considering the animal, as I have already said, something supernatural. Buckley is not the only European who encountered the bunyip. Years before Buckley's escape, mineralogist Joseph Charles Bailey heard a terrifying roar from a billabong in 1801. And between 1821 and 1822, Edward Smith Hall, who later helped found the Bank of New South Wales, spotted not one but two bunyips in Lake Bathurst, one of each variety. The first time was a five-minute sighting of a bulldog-headed bunyip thrashing in the water, while the second happened as he was drying himself from a bath. A three-foot-long black head and neck cut through the lake for 300 yards before finally submerging. In April of 1872, a bunyip was seen gliding through Midgen in the lagoon at an incredible rate of speed. The witness was a shepherd who had made camp at the waterside. He described the beast as dog-like, but much larger than any retriever he had ever seen. Its body had long, jet-black hair and lacked any noticeable features, but its ears were immense. And by 1890, the Melbourne Zoo had collected so many reports that they mounted an expedition to capture a bunyip, but failed. While a live specimen eluded researchers, the same might not be said for bunyip skeletons. Purported bunyip remains have indeed been recovered although none have been deemed conclusive. In 1818, Hamilton Hume and Hames Meehan found skeletal fragments from an unknown amphibious creature near Lake Bathurst, where Hall would have his sighting three years later. In 1846, 
Athol Fletcher found a nine-inch snout-like skull missing its lower jaw alongside the Marimbaji River in New South Wales. Debate raged whether or not it was a deformed calf skull before it was shipped off to the Australian Museum in Sydney, where it was placed on display for a short while. The skull supposedly had a single eye socket. As with so many tales involving ironclad paranormal evidence, the skull was eventually misplaced somehow. Bunyip sightings have become rarer in recent years. A Mr. and Mrs. L. Keegan claimed that on September 8, 1949, they saw a four-foot-long animal with shaggy ears swim through Victoria's Lariston Reservoir. Their sightings took place over a two-week period and included the wild detail that the bunyip actually used its ears to swim, imparting an uncanny speed through the water. Quite a few bunyip sightings have taken place in New South Wales in the 1960s, almost always involving the seal dog variety. Residents in one of the hot spots, a town called Burrowang, 86 miles southwest of Sydney, regularly heard the bunyip's roars echoing through the night. In fact, Ed Wolfrey, bartender at the local pub, claimed that the bunyip roared so loudly that it shook the bottles off the top shelf of the bar. These sightings came to an abrupt end when the neighboring swamp was dammed in 1974. Although a handful of bunyip sightings persist into the modern day, most are vague at best, fanciful at worst. None feature the long-necked variety anymore. If at first it seems disappointing that the bunyip is rarely reported today, Consider this. If the bunyip was ever merely a figment of the imagination, why would sightings cease? Wouldn't we expect people to continue making up stories? To the contrary, the abrupt decline in bunyip stories since the 1970s suggests that perhaps we are, for once, dealing with a species that has since become extinct, or at the very least has had its population stripped down to only a few specimens here and there. If this is the case, the Bunyam's disappearance serves as a grim reminder. Despite our desire to live in a world where we can continue to expand without consequence, our civilization nonetheless impacts the natural world around us. Those choices may also impact the supernatural world around us. In the case of Benman Lights, our actions seem to have increased how often they are seen. In the case of the bunyip, we may have eliminated its presence entirely, but we're not sure. But more importantly, what do you think? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. I would love to know your thoughts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button. And if you're new to the channel and you enjoy this kind of content, be sure to go ahead and smack that big old red subscribe button and keep your channel notifications on. So that way YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new video. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll check you guys in the very next video.